Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm your host, Jed Brown, founder of Low Season Traveller, and this week we are delighted to be joined by Zoran Pejovic, who is the Director of Development for Maslina Resort, which is a stunning new luxury property located on the island of Var, which is located in the Adriatic Sea, just off the southern coast of Croatia. In this episode, we learn that not only does VAR have the most UNESCO heritage of any island in the world, but it's also home to Europe's first public theatre and is the birthplace of organised tourism in Europe. It's actually been a favourite wellness destination since the Austro-Hungarian era. Let's hear from Zoran as he talks to us about why VAR is such a wonderful low-season destination. Enjoy. So Zoran, you are most welcome to the Low Season Traveller Insider Guides podcast. Great to have you with us. How are you? Pleasure to be here. And I'm very, very good here from the uh, beautiful island of Hvar. Uh, That's I was going to was going to be my first to question. With, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pleasure to connect with you all the way in Manchester. And, and how is the weather in Hvar today? Today is uh, what would you call that? Overcast slight overcast some uh, I, I was always impressed how many words for clouds and rain you have in, in UK you know because for us it's like it's it's either super clear or rain you know and then but you get all of these drizzle shower rain uh, so, it, yeah it's fascinating isn't it because the um, we always learned at school that the Inuit people in northern Canada have about 30 different words for snow because that's all they see is snow and therefore there's different types. It might be powdery, it might be wet and there was a different word for each one. And I think maybe it's the same with, uh, with the UK. Basically, we've got so much cloud cover and so much awful weather that we have a number of different terms and expressions for it. Exactly, uh, exactly, it's kind of exactly. indicative of, of, of where we live, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now for us, for us, it's mainly clear skies. Uh, Island of Juar, uh, is actually, uh, according to some metrics, the sunniest island in Europe. Oh. We get between 2,800 and 3,000 of hours of sunshine per year on average. Um, and I mean, it's 250 days of clear uh, of clear skies. Some some years even more. We get some rain. I mean, we hope for some rain in certain months because we have a lot of. Um, wine uh, wine growing uh, areas and uh, uh, agriculture is, is is actually has come back this year big time because of the coronavirus so people were okay what to do now let's just start planting stuff and um, we we need rain in the in those crucial months otherwise otherwise it's it's too dry but uh, there is no danger on the island of Hoar that you are going to run into like a prolonged periods of rain perhaps february yeah. sometimes but other than that uh, other than that no not so much very good uh, just so so our so our listeners can be aware um so you are based in var h-v-a-r um right. whereabouts exactly in croatia is var describe it for our for our listeners that might not be aware so croatian coastline uh stretches from slovenia in the north so slovenia has a short coastline that kind of breaks it between Croatia and Italy. Mm -hmm. So you could, uh, you could say from Trieste almost, you know, or Venice. So it spreads from, uh, from that area all the way down south to Montenegro. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mo southernmost uh, city in Croatia is Dubrovnik. That's the one that everybody knows about. Yep. So Hva then oh, 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 entire Croatian coastline is dotted with islands. We like to say that we have thousand islands. It's not really thousand islands. Uh, it is over 1000 of different formations that kind of come out of the sea, islands, islets, rocks. Uh, but it's not like we have 1000 uh, inhabited islands. Mm -hmm. It's around 60, 60, 60 islands that, are perm uh, that have permanent inhabitants. And uh, those islands kind of change as you go from the south to the north. And here in the center of Dalmatia, we call this part we call Central Dalmatia, Central Dalmatian Islands. In the split aquatory, we have these large islands, Brač, Hvar, Kočula, Vis. These are, uh, 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 these are uh, 
la larger islands. Uh, just to give you a perspective, uh, for example, Brach is kind of the size of Malta, mm -hmm. and Huar is a bit smaller. It's around 70 kilometers across land. So it's a large, these are large islands, and these islands have been inhabited for thousands of years. Uh, island of Huar has uh, the oldest town on Eastern Adriatic uh, called Starigrad is where we are where we are right now. Starigrad means old town. Okay. Uh, originally the name of it was Pharos because the, it was the inhabitants from the island of Pharos from Greece who came to to this island and inhabited it. We are celebrating this year if I'm uh, not incorrect 2404th birthday. Wow. So, yeah, so I mean, not saying that we that the island was not inhabited prior to that. Yep. You know, we have a proof of uh, life here for at least nearly 7,000 years continuously, but mm -hmm. this is when the uh, kind of more of a city establishment uh, was erected. So, so that's when Pharos uh, life um, began yeah. with those Greek, Greek settlers 2,400 years ago. This this was what something that fascinated me that I uh, that I found from your website actually. Um, now I've never been to Croatia. I'm I'm quite well travelled. Um, I've never been to Croatia. I'm a bit embarrassed about that, especially speaking to you, Zoran. Um, and I will try and change that at some point in the near future. But um, what I hadn't realised, I mean, obviously I look on the map and I can sort of you know see the the, the location and I can kind of get a, a hint that there must be some incredible history um, attached to the whole of Croatia, actually. Um, but Hvar um, owns the most UNESCO uh, World Heritage Sites of any island in the world. Wow. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting fact that we have six different UNESCO protections on the island. Wow. So that's, a, that's another unique aspect of, of Hvar Island, besides having this oldest uh, settlement on Eastern Adriatic being the sunniest island in Europe, uh, last year voted the. This, I'm sounding like for a commercial. Go on, last go, year go, 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 go. <laughs> <laughs> last year voted uh, best island in Europe uh, by Condé Nast. Uh, oh wow! Uh, travel, yeah, readers of Condé Nast Traveler, and um, yeah, six different UNESCO protections. Uh, oh. Those those range between uh, the kind of historical architectural, like the Starigrad Plain, which was set up. Uh, during the Roman time, it's the, the way the, the land has been divided and parcelized to a more, uh, more recent ones, like, uh, I mean, when I say recent, it's 500 years uh, <laughs> procession, yeah, procession behind the cross, uh, for, or following the cross, yeah. is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a beautiful procession that's actually in off-season, it's, it's, it's before Easter, mm -hmm. so he, and I don't, I'm not saying that if you're, if you're um, it's only for the people of faith. I think it's a beautiful cultural heritage for both people of faith and people who are interested to understand how one uh, small community manages to preserve a 500 year old tradition un uninterrupted throughout the wars and uh, famine and, uh, and uh, natural disasters and even coronavirus pandemics. I, do, I was just about to ask, what about coronavirus? Did it survive that? Did it still carry on? Yes. So it Socially was, distanced, it, obviously. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> bro. So actually, I, I, I can disclose, this, but this was, a, major, uh, this was a, a matter of a major discussion in Croatian media because uh, the, the procession was allowed to happen in the time of the, of the highest uh, peak of, yeah. of the ep epidemics. At least what we thought was the epidemics. Let's not get into the actual uh, 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 problems about the, the coronavirus. But at that time, it was a pretty much a full lockdown. And then they said, okay, you can carry on with the procession. And people were quite furious saying like, okay, how come, you know, they can do it and we can't do it. And this is the pressure from the church. But actually, it's not the church who organizes it. It's the local people from, from the island. So it's actually, it wasn't, it wasn't the church. Yeah. But uh, they really followed all of the, all of the social distancing measures. Uh, people were walking, uh, 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 I think, at least two meters uh, apart from each other. And... Uh, and uh, there was even a live camera. So some, some, 
some uh, uh, some argue actually it's your fellow Manchester uh, born um, but now our own Huar resident Paul Bradbury who runs a local uh, portal called Total Creation News and he set up these cameras he says that this has been the most most attended uh, procession in the history because actually it was thousands of people who were watching online of course. Uh, and watched watched it so yeah it survived the coronavirus yeah. So then other, 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 uh, other uh, UNESCO protections that we boast are like we have this very special uh, agave lace uh, production that, has, that is done by the Benedictine nuns and then the, the Mediterranean diet is UNESCO protected. And then the clapa singing is this uh, uh, a cappella singing of men, uh, mm -hmm. traditional. And then uh, we also have the protection for the for the dry stone walls. So there is, yeah, uh, yeah there, I mean, literally here, either you step on thousands of years of history, or if you move into the forest, you kind of get into the untouched, untouched forest, so. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. The, I suppose, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the, you know, the UNESCO sort of the, the heritage side, and obviously there is an awful lot of history attached to Hvar Island. Um, what about then the rest of the landscape? So obviously it's a relatively small island. What's, um, you know, what, what is the sort of, I suppose, the flora and fauna like? It, it, you know, you're saying there that obviously there's, there's forests uh, on the island as well. Uh, beaches, nice beaches on the island. What's the kind of, what's the lay of the so, land literally? So, yeah, I mean, the, the, here on Huar, it's not like we really have a lot of sandy beaches. You know, the Croatian coastline, uh, there are parts of the Croatian coastline that have, uh, it's more pebbled beaches than the fine sandy beaches. I always tell the people when they ask me, I say, if you really want the white sand, you know, better to go to the Maldives. Yep. Uh, we are not here in the Mediterranean about the fine sandy beaches. You know, it's, it's different. It was a different geology that, uh, that has created uh, these little coves and little bays. And then at the end of those bays and coves, you would have a small, uh, pebble, generally a pebble beach. So most of the beaches on the island are pebbled. There are here and there some nice small sandy beaches, but uh, you wouldn't find like anything that would look like uh, uh, thousands of meters of beaches, especially not on the island of Huar. Some other areas in Croatia, yes, but on the island of Huar, no, you would have these small secluded uh, private beaches for, I mean, when I say private, it's you can't privatize the beach itself, but it makes it more private if only six people can be there. Yeah, know, absolutely. Or, it's know. a great way to social distance, actually, as well. Exactly. Yeah. Get your own beach. <laughs> Why not? So there's, there's yeah. obviously they've got quite a lot of coastline there as well. On, this, on the sand issue, I do sometimes think sand's a little bit overrated anyway, isn't it? I mean, it gets everywhere. Uh, it, it, actually, the water tends to be clearer, I seem to find. Whenever I go to places where there are sort of more stone beaches, it seems like the water seems to be clearer. Yeah, we have. I mean, well. the, the 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 turquoise colors uh, of Adriatic uh, on this side are incredible, as opposed to Italy, where there is much more mud, yep. mainly brought by the river Po. But ours, because it's mainly rocky coastline, and then uh, these uh, green pines that reflect into the sea. I mean, mm -hmm. the colors of the sea sometimes really look magnificent. It's it's. You know, I I mean, I I grew up uh, at these shores. And uh, I, I still can't uh, get enough of it. Fair so. play. Yeah. But mind you, from some of the photos that I've seen, I wouldn't be able to get enough of it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but is it very... that, yeah, I mean, we have, we have lush pine forests as well, uh, which is kind of, I must say, a, a thing of the 20th century, because uh, prior to that, uh, people of the island tried to cultivate more land, uh, either for vineyards or olive yards or or if they would have sheep, uh, they would actually not allow for the big forests uh, to grow. But then, you know, after Philoxera, I don't know how much you know about wine, but you know, the, this, this, this kind of nasty little thing that destroyed all of the vineyards in Europe at the beginning, end of 19th, the beginning of 20th century, literally swept away all of the, all of the vineyards and uh, Hvar, for example, at the end of uh, 19th, the beginning of 20th century, had 5,000 hectares of vineyards. Right now, it has only 350. 
So wow, we are not gosh. even, we have, what is there? I mean, it's, it's not even one tenth of what we had hundred years ago. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was worse than coronavirus for those people back then because their livelihoods were cut overnight. And most of the people from the central Dalmatian Islands actually moved to places like uh, California, New Zealand, Australia, Chile. And therefore you find a lot of winemakers over there bearing uh, uh, names from uh, because people just moved there and continued what they knew how to yeah. do they started planting vineyards yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? so it's like okay what do i do uh, start with what i did back home <laughs> very good so, yeah. no it's uh, it's interesting i suppose that actually links us to so you still have wine there today um what what kind of what kind of foods are sort of traditional foods of the region so it's it's really i mean different if we talk about the coastline area or we talk about the entire croatia uh because you know croatia like the rest of the balkans is really at the crossroads of cultures and civilizations mm -hmm. you know this is if you look at for example the, the 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 fall of roman empire and the division between eastern and western roman empire it the, the division went straight through the half of the balkans you know, the, 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 with one in the capital in Rome and another in capital in, in Constantinople, today is Istanbul. And then that division has kind of maintained ever since because the, 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 the uh, Ottoman Empire, for example, and Islam came furthest into Europe through uh, over Istanbul to kind of middle of the Balkans. And yeah. then Austro Austrian Empire, for example, came down all, and took all over the coastline and then we you know had venetian republic here for uh, over 400 years uh running running the 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 running the show for <laughs> on the entire adriatic so yeah it's really it's really if you're more uh you know people say is it our cuisine uh or is it uh, somebody else's cuisine i really think of the cuisines almost like a language mm -hmm. you know how languages adapt words from other for example we are using so many english words in all other languages these days because a lot of industries have only been developed in 20th century so there was no need to invent all these other words same is with the with the with cuisines you know cuisines adapt uh, borrow change or they die and then i mean if you say that there is a static cuisine that would be saying like there is a latin language or old greek you know, this is, these are not static things. And this is where I get a little bit upset when people try to say, oh, that's not authentic. Like, what is, what is... What's authentic I mean? mean? Yeah, yeah. What's authentic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's only people who can be authentic, not the cuisines. Yeah. Because it's an arbitrary chosen time in the past that you say, oh, this is, this is what we call now authentic. Oh, it was the recipe from 1850. But half of those ingredients either don't exist today or the ingredients are simply different. So yes. to get back to your to answering your question, it's our cuisine. It's really, you can say it's a kind of a mix of influences from Turkey uh, coming from the East, uh, Hungary coming from the North, uh, Austria and coming from the West. And then majority actually is the, is the uh, here on the Dalmatian coast is all these influences from the times of Venetian Republic and Italy. But again, based on very much local, obviously local produce and uh, the key aspect of when it comes to Dalmatian cuisine, is, at least uh, this is what we call Dalmatian cuisine here, on the, especially on the islands and the coastal area, is simplicity. It's mm. really simple ingredients uh, prepared to perfection, you know, and a large focus on a lot of olive oil. You know, so that's, uh, that's uh, you know, a lot of good seafood, a lot of good uh, olive oil, uh, a lot of good wine. So people uh, usually come very, very much surprised after after eating uh, the food here because it's uh, it's 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 not like we've tried to be with trends it's just that the trends are catching up with us if you would you know it's kind of the 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 simplicity of it you know you get a yeah. beautifully grilled sea bass with oh, some swiss yeah. chard and you know and uh, drizzled with olive oil and a glass of, of local uh bogdanush or poship or any other or even red wine we tend to drink red wine here or with with, uh, with fish as well so it's you know that's 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 uh, that's i guess the simplicity of it but uh, a lot of meat as well a lot of lamb especially traditionally especially on the islands 
you know, because uh, uh, lamb and goat, sheep and goats, the, those, those, because uh, they could live in these rugged terrains. Yeah. As a lot of, uh, lot of rocky, rugged terrains, some some areas don't look very hospitable. So there, uh, and then especially goats can can uh, yeah. they can survive on their own. Uh, beautiful animals. They they, <laughs> they adapt like, very yeah. easily. Yeah. Yeah, you just let them out <laughs> and they come back and yeah and uh, so. Yeah, and that, that's another thing that almost uh, most of the local meat is free range. Yeah. You know, when I went, when I went first time abroad, uh, not counting the 90s, but for example, early to maybe 2000, 2001, when I went to the States, so now 20 years ago, and then they started explaining to me free range, free range. I was like, oh, is there any other way? You know, it's like, <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't know that there was, there was, and there was a huge shock learning about these uh, farming practices. Not saying that there is no such things in Croatia today uh, as well, but here on the islands, it's mainly, I mean, it's very ethical, as, as, I guess as ethical as, as, as it can be expected in, in, uh, in terms of, of, of growing animals from it. So uh, now let's move on to uh, Maslina Resort. Yeah. Tell us, uh, for our listeners out there that maybe uh, haven't, uh, you know, aren't aware of Maslina Resort, give us a little bit of an overview of uh, Maslina Resort and um, and what you guys do, and you know, and, and and what kind of people come and and visit you guys. Well, so we are uh, looking actually to open our doors for the first time in August first this year. So we are a new property. Uh, it's a, a luxury boutique independent hotel. Uh, uh, developed by actually French investors, a uh, family from France that fell in love with the with their area and when the particular Maslenica Bay where we developed the project, and then they stumbled upon me. I'm a hotelier of 20 years of experience, worked uh, across the world, India, China, United States, most of the seas. And we decided to develop uh, uh, together a property that would that would fit this category of uh, luxury boutique resort. Uh, it's going to be 50 keys, or it is 50 keys plus three magnificent villas, uh, spa housed in a separate building, so that the people can kind of journey into the spa as opposed to finding it tucked away somewhere in the basement of the building, like it's too often. Uh, a, a separate, a beautiful uh, seaside uh, beach restaurant. Oh, nice! It's gonna be open breakfast, lunch, and dinner, kind of like whole day dining, doubling up as a breakfast bakery, boulangerie, turning into a more uh, tapas pizzeria style during the day. At the main hotel building, where is all of these uh, 50 uh, accommodation units, we will have the main restaurant, which is gonna be an upscale, upscale Mediterranean dining. Um, more towards fine dining. We have an amazing chef uh, in the team, Patricia Ayo, who used to have two Michelin stars in New York and uh, comes back with the background of Six Senses and uh, mm. some other premium luxury resorts. So she's bringing that uh, kind of culinary uh, freedom with her coming from a place like New York where it's actually you're allowed to mix things that usually here maybe traditionally we wouldn't mix, yeah. but we're gonna fake focus entirely on local produce. Mm -hmm. So it's really trying to reduce our uh, footprint. Mm -hmm. It's another of these now we moved to Love footprint. That. Yeah, yeah <laughs> footprint zero kilometers. <laughs> so we're yeah. really trying to do that. There's gonna be a wine bar, a wine and culture club. It's gonna act like an in-house concierge, mm -hmm. in-house uh, hub of knowledge so that we can organize all of our tours activities uh, in-house for the guests, especially when it comes to wine and culture. Yeah. Uh, but not, not forgetting the adventure part either. There's going to be plenty to do with the mountain biking, diving, uh, even some rock climbing on the island. So the, for, the, uh, for the adventure souls, there's going to be plenty of those activities. However, I would say if our, our bigger focus is the, on the wine and culture side of things yep. because of the both wine history and wine make and beautiful wines that we have on the island, but then also, as you mentioned, these six different UNESCO protections. Yeah. So we're really it, trying to combine all of that. It, pl plays, the spa, it plays to the strengths of the island, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. And I, I didn't mention actually our tagline is mindful luxury. We are trying to put together a 
two concepts that back in the day probably wouldn't marry so easily because luxury has been defined over over time as uh, uh, you know excess and difficult access and we think that uh, we might still be difficult to access in terms of uh, both we are on an island and a price point but we are not th we think that it doesn't have to be an excess of things where we are throwing things away we think we can be still mindful about how we do things and uh, so we are trying to use no single use plastic in the hotel not promising 100% because these are all things that are still in the process of development and we still don't have perfect replacements for everything but we will try to minimize the use of single use plastic to the point of no use uh we all of our like all of our linen is 100% uh, certified organic uh we're going to try to use no chlorine in the pools but use the uh, the, the these ozone filters we have our own 8000 square meter garden where we want to grow some of our fruits, vegetables, and especially herbs, because we are promoting another cool concept called um, garden to skin. Uh, so that the treatments in the spa are done with the herbs that you pick, you can pick yourself that morning yeah. before the treatment in the garden, and then they are later meshed up to for the for the for the actual treatment. So yeah, I mean, plenty of things out there and very much in line with the ideas of low season travel. Mm -hmm. So I actually, the only two months where we are not thinking to do anything special are July and August, because those two months are anyway going to be uh, full and honestly are the two least exciting months. Yeah. Because it's hot, you know, the temperatures can go well about above 35, it's um, it's in places quite crowded and uh, there might be you know very big crowds on the airports obviously not this year we are not talking about 2020 mm -hmm. because this year uh, i think we can forget about the crowds but uh you know so but any other month we we are still a seasonal property you know so we want to be we're going to be open from march to november so eight months yep. uh we would like to stay open all 12 months and there is plenty to offer on the island and there is enough interest. However, our problem is connectivity of split airport in the winter months. So, you know, it's it, now we, I'm really mindful of this idea of pre-corona and post-corona. Uh, pre-corona people already, well, they were traveling larger number of times a year, shorter, uh, shorter stays. Mm -hmm. Talking about like, now the the take uh, 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 what we call uh, you know this acronym Henry's you know uh, high earning not rich yet yep. uh, like or, or double income no kids so these are like these are like some of our uh, some of our uh, like target markets they would tend to travel maybe five five six times a year three four five days each each uh, each uh, holiday or they wouldn't even call it they are not tourists anymore they're travelers so uh on the on the on the discovery of the world and uh, however you know then they wouldn't like to spend too much time lost time between the airports and connections because it's shorter visit however now we are seeing an increase in long term in the request for long term uh, stays so then it might be actually different people may might not need might not mind that they uh, spend half a day getting here uh, but then again they might want to avoid the hubs because of the a lot of the tests that will come with it so let's see but the the idea is that this island for example is more most of the croatian coast but especially Hvar, is more suited even for the low season low season travel than for the high season travel just just on that it, it sounds like quite an obvious point but obviously you're an island how far are you from the mainland and you know, how, how do you get there? You know, there are some islands which are joined by land bridge, or is it by mm. ferry? What's the? How actually do you get between? So we are, we are we are uh, our main point of entry is Split, yeah. And uh, Split is the largest city on the eastern Adriatic, uh, so it's around two hundred thousand people. Um, it's very well connected city because there is a highway from Split that connects you to all of the to to the European highway network. There is an airport in Split, which handled last year 3 million passengers. 
which is already quite decent. And uh, we have a connection from uh, uh, city of Split by ferry that takes you two hours from Split to Huar. We have a catamaran that takes one hour. But actually, uh, for our guests, we will be offering an option of, we have our own boat. Uh, beautiful uh, 14 meter uh, transfer boat built here in Split uh, and that he has uh, sailed for the first time uh, last week, uh, hit the waters and uh, we will be offering this additional transport option for the guests directly from the airport because airport is conveniently located uh, uh, at sea in Split. So you literally either walk out 300 meters to the port or we take a taxi or a golf cart down to the sea and then one hour later you are at the property so we are we are taking get so literally you could be for example sitting in manchester uh and then a two and a half hour flight to split uh easy checkout uh and one hour later you are uh, at maslina resort wow yeah so you know it's it's we are actually very close it's yeah. just that people don't have it in their minds in such way but Last year, with the, with the way we we were connected with the, with the, so many European airports, it was it was really easy to get here. Let's see how things happen this year and in, in the in the coming years. But literally, one hour directly from the airport to the property, you're already sipping your first uh, gin and tonic or uh, glass of champagne. Nice. And to make it even more user friendly, we really tried to look to map the the customer journey and to remove those friction points uh we will be doing on boat check-in for the guests that decide to come with the boat we take care of the check-in during their one hour of transfer even though that transfer is not a transfer anymore it's part of the experience because you're on your own private boat sailing the adriatic between split and Hvar, uh you know enjoying the view of the of the aquatory seeing different islands and then one of our guys just comes here would you mind just signing this uh, piece of paper let me scan your passport have a nice day you welcome we welcome you then to the property you can go directly into your room or you can go for lunch you know there is no none of that hustle and friction that comes with checking in after yeah. long travel yeah so, i think that that's the um that's always the challenge, isn't it? You know, in, in, in many places around the world where, you know, once, you, once, you, once your plane lands and the aircraft doors open, that's almost like where the, the stress starts, you know, the, the hassle. You know, I get, I, get a, I get a heavy feeling in my heart when the aircraft doors open because I know I've got to fight through this large airport and run all of the crowds and get in the luggage and queuing up for this and queuing up for that. And then when I get through, there's going to be masses of people and, it's a big experience, and then and then you you know you have a transfer which may or may not be be stressful. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what, what I, I like mean, from the... go on, sorry. No, no, no. I mean, th this is this is exactly what you're saying. What we tried to to to, 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 to remove, to kind of dissect, and yeah. then to remove because you know it's and and you know we are uh, let's 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 face it. I mean, we in the hotel industry are also very slow to change. I mean, our industry the facilities are changing you know the, the 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 certain things that were luxury 30 years ago are today standard but a lot of things are still the same like 100 years ago i mean now we have all of your details before arrival we have credit carded everything is in there we still ask you would you mind sitting there until yeah. i fill up this 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 piece of uh paper actually it's not paper anymore you're typing into your uh, property management system or may i scan your credit card and it's like i mean especially for the luxury luxury hotels you know where you have people planning to spend 20 30 thousand euros with you and they've traveled from other parts of the world and they've used i mean i have actually never heard of anybody not paying eventually you know <laughs> so even if there is if there is one even if there is one case in per thousand let's say one per thousand that doesn't pay why do we destroy the experience of 999 because of their one i mean is it worth it like it's it's you know let the people check into the room and say like how about we we catch those things later or do an in-room check-in or on boat check-in or pre-check-in something because the whole process when you're waiting at the at, at that reception desk 
it's, it's almost like, okay, is this a holiday? What is this? You know, just, yeah. I've just gone through all of these mandatory things at the airports because the traveling, traveling uh, by fl plane stopped being fun after 9-11 completely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to get even worse now after coronavirus. So, I mean, that's stressful enough in itself. You know, like in the States, you have, they are now, they were advising you pre-corona to be four hours before departure at the airport if you're on an international flight. I think, what is it going to be now, six? I mean, you know, come day before, camp outside, you know, and then... <laughs> Forget it. Do you know what, you may as well get the train. You know, you probably get the train from London, honestly, to split yeah. quicker than that, you know. I, I, yeah, probably yeah. not a bad experience, actually. <laughs> Uh, it's insane, but I, I must admit, I do, I do absolutely commend you for that because they, that whole check-in process. Uh, yeah, I'm one of these. I, I get frustrated with it all the time. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've already provided every bit of my details. They've got my address. They've got my email, and yet the first thing they make me do is repeat all of that. Can I take your credit card? I'm like, I, I always say it to them every time. They must hate me. I always say, look, you know, guys, you, you've got this stuff. I mean, is your are your systems that poor? that you can't kind of deal with this. And, and actually it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just doing my job. And I'm like, well, you know, they, they, it's, but it's, it's not just that one hotel. It seems to be the experience everywhere. Uh, but I think, yeah. you know, I, I absolutely commend you on that because I think that, you know, when there's been a lot of talk about, you know, what travel is going to be like in the future and in the immediate future with COVID-19. And I think you're right, air travel is definitely going to be even more painful than it has been. And therefore anything that we can do in resort to alleviate and take away that pain and you know start that pleasurable experience from the very beginning i think uh, can only be a listen there, be a, uh, we, there is things that we can't uh, that we can't change because they are in the hands of the governments and these intergovernmental bodies and things like this but there are things between your side and our side where we can actually make it we have then to make sure that we don't add up to those things either, you know, as travel agencies or as, as providers of service, you know, that, that we kind of are there so that people feel a bit more comfortable uh, traveling and trusting us. Because, you know, it's really now about that uh, ease of use and uh, reduction of stress and uh, reduction of discomfort. And uh, if we can't do our job to ensure those things are met, Forget about the promotion, elation, uh, delight, satisfaction, amazing food and wine and UNESCO protection heritage. Because if you're not feeling satisfied about your safety and your health and your, you know, you don't understand the process, how can you enjoy them, these other things? You know, these are prerequisites for, the, for, for what comes about. And we were taking that for granted because we kind of had Okay, here in the Balkans, we had a war in the 90s. So I guess for us, it's not so far away to think about. But I mean, rest of Europe had, had it kind of quite well for the past 70 years, you know? It was like most of the year was better than the previous years. So it's like, and people are now like, we are taking all of these aspects of safety and security for given, as given. And then you could focus on promotion and making one's, experience really be a peak experience and really emerging themselves into these uh into these into these uh experiences that we create for them but right now i think we kind of have to rewind slightly and go back to the concept of okay what it is that i need to make so that the guests feel like this is what i need to do this is how i get from point a to b they're gonna take care of this for me and they are not going to make it unnecessarily uh, difficult so I and that. I guess this is you and I people in the industry who who are kind of the first and the last point of the guest yep. journey uh, it's our job to to make that happen because we Absolutely. can't change what uh, WHO decides one day wear a mask next day don't wear a mask third day wear a mask fourth day don't wear a mask it's out of our hands but this is not so that's exactly true so remind us the opening date for August Maslina 1st. Resorts? August Pardon 1st. Me? August 1st. August oh, 1st. Yeah. Perfect. Um, wish you every success with the opening. Um, I'm sure it will be a roaring success. I would urge uh, everybody listening to, um, to visit maslinaresort.com uh, 
uh, online and you can have a look at the story behind the resort um, as well as see, uh, you know, a variety of different photos. Of the resort. It looks absolutely stunning. Um, you know, I was looking at it before and just thinking, looking out of my window uh, as it's pouring with rain and very cold oh, actually. God. In, uh, in Manchester, wishing that I was there, uh, but wish you all all the very best uh, with the with the opening. Um, to remind our listeners out there, uh, Maslina Resort um, is open at the moment uh, from March. It's going to be open from March through to November. Low season months, good low season months would be October and November. I'm guessing, right? Uh, March, April, uh, October, November. Yeah, March, April, perfect. October, November. I mean. Uh, October is probably the most perfect month to visit if I was the one traveling uh, because we have both it's the wine harvest still going on and then the great the olive oil olive harvest so you can experience both of those and uh, the, the the colors are just beautiful and uh, people are kind of at the end of the season so it's really relaxed you know there is no panic no stress you know, even the locals are feeling, you know, they're, it's stable, you know, we are kind of nearing, nearing the, the winter hiber hibernation. So it's really, really, really perfect time to visit. Lovely. And even if you catch uh, a day of rain, which is actually not very likely for October at all, uh, but you can just find a hideaway in one of the local cellars and kind of uh, ensure that you get through the day with some wine. So, sounds like a plan to me. Zoran, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us uh, on the Low Season Traveller Insider Guides podcast. Uh, really appreciate it and, um, and really uh, really looking forward to hearing how it goes once you're open and, um, and hopefully at some point getting over there myself and maybe the next podcast absolutely. we can record face to face over wine. Absolutely, <laughs> there would be absolute pleasure. You, are, you will be our dear guest whenever you decide, you decide to come. We will have actually a little amphitheater in our garden. Oh, yeah. Where I'm planning to that we do uh, these kind of talks and maybe mini concerts and tastings. It's going to be a perfect setting for our next podcast. I love it. I love it. We'll do it via video as well. Perfect. Zoran, thank you so much. Have a great week. Uh, have a great weekend. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. It was a pleasure. So there you have it. Huge thanks again to Zoran from Maslina Resort and please do visit maslinaresort.com to see exactly what a wonderful place this is. Next week we head across the Adriatic to Italy as we learn just what the experience is like in Italy right now as it starts to open up once more. I do hope you can join us. Thanks as always for your company this week. Have a great week ahead. Stay healthy, stay safe, keep your travel dreams alive and don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family and social networks. And finally, remember that now more than ever, travel is better without the crowd.